quick series that we started last week. If you remember, Elias Milky was supposed to be here last week. He canceled on Thursday because of some health reasons, and I knew exactly what I was going to be speaking on. It wasn't the series that um, I had planned, but God had been putting on my heart the whole week as I was fasting last week, the topic of depression. And so we started a series last week about the topic of depression. What is it? Why do we get it? And what does the Bible say about it? And as we read through the Bible, you'll be no interested to notice that the Bible actually says a lot of things about depression. And actually, the Bible speaks a lot to people who are depressed. As we talked about last week, Scripture tells us that you are valuable in God's eyes. And what he says in Luke 12, 7. The Bible tells us to hang in there because God has plans for each and every one of you, even though you might not realize it. The Bible says that we can have hope even when there is no reason to have hope. As it says in Psalm 62, 5, Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope, my hope comes from Him. And we have to remember that our hope doesn't come from circumstances or situations, but our hope comes from God and only God. And then finally, in Ecclesiastes 9.4, the Bible tells us that we should never lose hope. It says, to all the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. So some of us may make joke when they ask, we ask people, how are you doing today? And they say, I'm living. You should say, yes, you are. Be pleased, be happy, be joyous about that. Because there's always hope. The Bible shows us that depression can strike anyone. It can strike old people like Abraham. It can strike successful people like Jonah. Remember Jonah went out, he preached a sermon and converted a whole city, a whole town. Now most pastors would be ecstatic about that. But we read that Jonah was actually depressed because he had had that much success. We see in Job that depression can actually strike wealthy people as well. And in King David we learn that depression can strike young people. For all of us, we have to know and we have to realize that depression is a normal part of being human. And it can be triggered by many, many things. Some sad events, like the death of someone. And even some happy events, like the birth of a child. So today we're going to continue our discussion about depression. And we're going to talk about three practical things that the Bible says, practices, that we can put in place to actually defeat and conquer and fight depression. But before we start that, I do want to talk about one thing, because in all things in the Bible, there's one thing that the Bible very specifically says when it's talking about illnesses, when it's talking about injuries, when it's talking about trials, and when it's talking about tribulations. And the first thing that the Bible says is that in all things, we should always begin with the Lord. That's what Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 6, where he says, Be anxious for nothing, but let your requests be known to God. Paul tells us that there really is no reason for us to be stressed or anxious or worried. Because if we're filled with Jesus Christ, then if He is truly our Savior, then we must give our request, make our request known to Him, and then allow Him to take those from us, and deal with them. Because I don't know about you, but in my life, I've never seemed to do a really good job of handling those situations or circumstances. But every time I've allowed him to take over, he seems to do a much better job. But the reason why we must first make all petitions, all trials, all illnesses, all injuries known to him is because the cure begins with God. In all things, the cure begins with God. And that actually includes depression. Now, you'll hear pastors talk about, you know, when we're talking about illnesses or injuries, and sometimes they'll be talking about depression, that you may get the impression from some pastors that, that really we shouldn't seek the advice or counsel from doctors or physicians or medicines, because really we should expect the Lord to heal us. And if we haven't been healed by that, then we must be kind of like the Job scenario. If we haven't been healed by that, then something must be wrong with us and we haven't given it to the Lord. Now, I want to tell you my opinion of that. I don't think that that's true at all. I go to the Lord for everything 
every illness, every injury, every trial, and every tribulation. And I do pray that God will heal and cure and solve. And I do believe that God does that. But I also believe that sometimes when we go to the Lord in prayer, that sometimes the way he answers our prayer is through doctors, through nurses, through medicine, and through technology. You know, I always talk to people when they're, um, when they're in pain. They're like, you know, I, I'm not going to take any pain meds. My answer is, you know, the good Lord made medicine for a reason. I think we should take it. You know, when I had, remember about a year ago, I had a, you know, I came to church one day and my tooth was really messed up and I had to have an emergency root canal. And as soon as I was done speaking, I didn't mess around with fellowship. I went home and I let the good Lord bless me with medicine for the next 24 hours until I could get into the dentist. Now, I believe God answered my prayer. My tooth's fine. But sometimes God will use physicians. God will use medicine. And the reason why I'm saying that is if you're struggling with depression, do not think that you have to solve it on your own. Do not think that you would be weak or unchristian-like if you sought help for it. You know, you remember in Matthew 9, 12, Jesus actually said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Even Jesus acknowledged that there was a time, a purpose, and a place where we should seek the care and services of a physician. So when we pray for curing of cancer, Sometimes that cure comes through the hands of a physician. When we pray for healing of an illness, sometimes that answer comes through medicine. So if you're struggling with depression today, do not think that you have to go that road yourself. Do not think that you would be considered weak or failure if you sought help for that. Because I do believe that the good Lord made physicians made medicine, made technology for a reason. And regardless of how God wants to heal us, we always have to remember that the cure begins with God. So before we make a call to a doctor, before we take that medicine, we must first begin on our knees praying, as Paul said. Don't be anxious, but go to God in prayer, asking for a cure, asking for healing, because we have to remember that God truly does want to heal us in His time, in His plan, and in His place. And what's interesting is we start talking today about depression and what the Bible says about depression. You know, it's really interesting what's happening because we've always thought that the Bible was always good for the soul, amen? Like we follow the commandments, we do what the Bible says because it's good for us and it's good for eternity. But what is being found out now, which is really cool, is that the scientific medical world is doing research on Christians and people that go to church. And what they're finding is that biblical practices and standards are not only good for our soul, but medical research and data is supporting the fact that the Bible and godly living is actually good for our health as well. In 2006, the American Society of Hypertension established that churchgoers have lower blood pressure than the non-faithful. In 2004, UCLA suggested that college students involved in religious activities are more likely to have better mental and emotional health than those who do not. In 2006, the University of Texas discovered that the more often you go to church, the longer you live. And exactly the same outcome was recently reported in the American Journal of Public Health, which studied nearly 2,000 older Californians for five years. Those who attended religious services were 36% less likely to die during this half, this half decade than those who didn't. So today we're going to look at some biblical practices that we can implement to help battle, help defend, and help prevent depression from coming into our life. Now before I start, I want to go through two of the main symptoms that people experience when they're battling depression. The first symptom that people, people often, will, often will experience is isolation. It's that feeling where you don't want to be around anybody. Some people get so bad that they don't even want to leave their house. And as they sit in their house, maybe they don't even have lights on, but they sit in darkness. They're so isolated, they've shut off all of the world, that they can't even imagine that somebody else would be in there with them. But then there's also immobilization. People get so depressed 
and so down that they can't do anything. It's been reported that some people will actually die from starvation because they're so depressed that they won't even take the time or make the effort to feed themselves. But thankfully for us, the first two practices that the Bible talks about addresses these first two symptoms, isolation and mobilization. Now in Acts 2.46 we read, For continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Paul wrote in Philippians 2.2, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, you know, real quick side note, you know if Brother Wayne and Carol were back in the Old Testament, you know that would be saying that they didn't just break bread, but they would have chips and salsa as well. So I just want to let you know, if I ever do get down to writing a Bible, I may just throw that in there for you guys. But, but so the first symptom is isolation. Now, what would be the opposite of isolation? Well, the opposite of isolation would be non-isolation, right? Or in biblical terms, what we would be talking about is fellowship. And that's exactly what Paul wrote about in Philippians. That's exactly what we read about in Acts chapter 2. That these people were joyous and they were glad because they were fellowshipping with one another. Because if you've ever been in true fellowship, you know that it is hard to be depressed when you are fellowshipping. It is hard to be depressed when you are fellowshipping. Now fellowship, for those of you that don't know, is that's relationship with other Christians that is intimate, that is frequent, and that is meaningful. And I've actually broken it down to a couple of different categories because we have different types of fellowship in the church and outside of the church. You know, when people come into church, I call it, we have the three H's. We have the hello, we have the hugs, we have the how are you doing? Not bad, huh? <laughs> Believe me, that took me a while, too. <laughs> it's letting people know the moment they walk in this church that you are glad to see them that you're happy that they are here, that church wouldn't be the same without them. But we also have the fellowship after church, and I call that the three T's. It's the time, the talk, and the transformation. It's letting people know after church that they're worth spending time with, that they're worth sitting down with a cup of coffee, that they're worth getting to know. And then outside of church, we have what I call the three P's. Don't laugh. The prayer, the partner, and the persistence. Amen. It's letting people know that you are available to them no matter what time or day. That you would never be too busy for them. It's spending time with them in prayer when they call you up because they're having a, a bad day. It's letting them know that you are always going to be there for them, not just on Sundays, not just on the holidays, but any day you will be there for them. And it's persistence. It's being a true friend, a meaningful friend, a lasting friend for people. See, church, I challenge you that the moment the last song is done, I challenge you to spend time getting to know people and to allow people to get to know you. Fellowship just isn't critical to the church, but it's also critical to you. And what's I was, I was so excited because on Thursday night when we were in Dave's Bible study, he told me that coming up, the main theme and topic of the narrow road is going to be fellowship. So if you don't really understand fellowship, or if you want to know more about fellowship, I encourage you to come to Dave's, um, to Dave, Dave's Bible study. But what's amazing about this fellowship, and here's why it's so important if you're battling or struggling with depression, is that science has proven, hear me out, church, science has proven that fellowship within a church and within Christians will significantly improve your mental and physical health. The Gallup poll did a, a, a survey of religious people and found out that religious people tend to report more life satisfaction, and a new study explains why. You see, the statistics I read you earlier, it was all about church, right? And people would think people that go to church are healthier. Well, if I want to be healthy, then all I have to do is go to church, right? Show up on Sundays, leave, and life is good. But what they found in this study, and what they're beginning to find, that it's not 
just going to church that makes the difference. It's not just reading your Bible every day. It's not just praying to God every day. What they're finding is that the difference in people and why people are healthier and happier is not because of the building, but it's because of the people inside the building. It's because of the fellowship that we share with one another that people report being mentally happier and healthier. These two gentlemen, I'm going to read you some quotes here. These two gentlemen were not Christians. These researchers that did this survey, they were not Christians. In fact, they were actually self-proclaimed atheists. But here's what they wrote. It's not their spirituality, belief in heaven, or even the ritual act of praying or going to a house of worship that leads the pious to happiness. Rather, the study found it's the close friends people gain through their religions that makes a difference. My co-author and I have found that religious, religious, religious people tend to volunteer more, care more about their community, and do more good in their relationships, said Shayun Lim, a sociologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. All of that can be explained by friendships in the congregation that seem to make people not only happier, but also nicer and better citizens. The researchers also found that if you compare two people with the same number of close friends in life, both inside the church and out, those with stronger relationships in church report being happier. In other words, people get more satisfaction out of their church friendships than they do out of their friendships in their lives. Going to a friendly church gives you a strong social network and a ready-made support group, which in turn gives you a more positive outlook on life and offers vital help in times of need. The Harvard scientists were so startled by their findings that they considered altering their own religious behavior. As Professor Lim said, I'm not a religious person, but I personally began to think about whether I should go to church. And actually they're beginning to call religion and this fellowship the science of faith or the medical faith. You see, church, we read the Bible and we do what it says because it's good for our soul. Little, little, little did we know that it's good for our lives as well. So I encourage you, whether you're depressed or not depressed, to take time with people after church. Talk with them. Eat with them. Laugh with them. Cry with them. Make it a point each day that you're in church and each week to reach out to someone at this church that you don't know well. Call them, text them, visit them, email them. You see, I'd like to share with you a personal experience of how this fellowship helped me through a very difficult time. And uh, Aaron, if you can go to the next slide. For those of you that know, I didn't think this was going to hear me. About three and a half years ago, we tried to adopt a baby girl. Her name was Faith. And we thought for sure, the judge, everybody, well not the judge, the social workers, everybody said she's going to be your baby, there's no problem. Don't worry about it. And one Thursday out of the blue, I got a call from the social worker and they said the judge gave the baby back to the mom. And within an hour, the baby was gone. Never be seen from again. Janine was out of town in San Francisco. She never even got a chance to say goodbye to her daughter. That night, it truly was like there was a death in the family. Janine was alone crying in her hotel room up in San Francisco. The boys who in three short months had become attached to their sister wanted to do nothing in life. So the next day, Janine was at, up in San Francisco. The boys were at school because they still wanted to go to school. And I was walking around the house, and everywhere I looked, I saw those darn toys from our daughter. And I saw her pictures, and I saw her blankets. And I thought I was doing a pretty good job of keeping it together. And all of a sudden, there was a knock on my door. And Carlito shows up. He didn't say anything, but he came into the, the house, and he put his arms around me, and he just hugged me. And I began to break down and cry hysterically. You see, I didn't know that I needed that fellowship, but thankfully Carlito did. Because he did exactly what I needed right then and right there. And it was because of him showing up 
and holding me and letting me cry. And he was crying too. And it was actually kind of funny because at the time I had a, a guy working on the washer, a Sears repairman working on the washer. And I have a little chihuahua running around the house. And all of a sudden there's two guys crying and hugging in the house and the chihuahua's running around. But, but, but it was because of that fellowship that I didn't even know I needed that began the healing process for me. See, church, I know right now, because studies and statistics will prove it, I know right now there are people in this church that are depressed. And if you're depressed, church, after service, you're not going to go running up to someone and start talking to someone. But if you're depressed, I bet you they're praying that after service, one of you will come running up to them. So church, before and after service, make it a point to have that fellowship with people. Because it truly is just not good for this church, but it's good for all of our health as well. So if fellowship addresses the isolation, what about the immobilization? What does the Bible say we can do to get us out of that feeling that I just can't do anything? Well, the best way we can get out of the feeling of I just can't do anything is actually by doing something. Because it's hard to be depressed when you're serving. It is hard to be depressed when you're serving not only people, but also God. Because God understands when we serve Him and we serve others that blessings will flow because of them. In church, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you are, regardless of what you've accomplished in life, God has given you very specific gifts. You know what you can do. You know what you like to do. And you know that when you start doing those things, regardless of what it is and regardless of who it's for, you know that it brings joy and satisfaction to your life. So if you're sitting here today and you're feeling like, well, I can't do anything. I'm worthless. I'm meaningless. Nobody cares about me. Then the best thing that you can do right now is go out and begin doing things for other people. Use the gifts that God has given you so that God can in return show you just how valuable, how precious, how special you are. That week we lost faith. Sunday after church, Janine made it a point. All four of us went to Pomona and we spent the afternoon feeding homeless families. You see, the best thing that we could do at that point as part of our healing process, it wasn't good to sit in the house and get depressed. It wasn't good to sit around looking at each other and asking why. It wasn't good to sit around crying out to God and saying, it's not fair, God. The best thing that we could do is begin doing something. And church, I can't tell you how much that helped us. Because remember, every time you serve, it's a double blessing. Yes, we bless God, but in return, we get blessed by God by serving people. Now, that may be scary for you if you're depressed right now, but I tell you, take the leap of faith. Galatians 5.13 says, but through love, serve one another. And if you don't think you're worthy, if you don't think you're special, if you don't think it matters whether or not you do anything. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. When you start serving God and start serving others, two amazing things begin to happen to you. Number one, as you serve others, there's a feeling of thankfulness that gets created. Thankfulness by the people that you are serving. You see, church, if you're depressed, you may think, I'm nothing. I'm of no value. I'm worthless. Nobody cares about me. But if you happen to be serving a hot meal to a homeless person on a cold day, in their eyes, you're very worthy. You're very valuable. In their eyes, you mean the world to them. So number one, you get that thanks that you've always wanted, but you don't think that people have given to you. 
And as you begin to get that thanks from people, you will find that you begin to have a sense of thankfulness inside of you as well. As we serve those meals on that Sunday, God reminded me of how blessed I was. I had a beautiful wife. I had two beautiful and healthy sons. No, we didn't have our daughter anymore. But see, God was reminding me of all the positive and good things I did have in my life. And I promise you that wouldn't have happened if I was sitting inside of our house. In fact, the day after they took our daughter from us, I called, Janine called me and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm leaving. And she said, where are you going? I said, I have no idea. I just can't be in the house anymore. I just drove around until I had to go pick up the boys from school. If you don't think that you can do anything, if you don't think that you are worthy, then I say you need to start serving. But serving also does another thing. It's not just the thankfulness. It will encourage us as well. As you begin to see joy in people's lives and on people's faces because of what you're doing for them, you will begin to feel joy inside of your heart. It is almost impossible to make someone happy and not feel some of that yourself. You see, it's something that God has built inside of each and every one of us. A desire, a longing to make people happy, to bring joy. That's why everybody I talk to, someone who goes with Brother Wayne down to Skid Row, I ask them, how was it? You know what they say? It was amazing. You know what they say? I got more out of it than the people we serve. That's why when we go on Christmas morning, we feed homeless in the park. I tell you, church, we are more blessed by doing that than the people we feed than the people we pray for, than the people we give gifts for. And here's how I know that's true. Now you may be thinking, I'm crazy. Our boys have been doing it for six years now. Jordan was seven, Ryder was four. Not once have they ever said, why do we have to do this? Why can't we just open gifts? They look forward to going out and serving the homeless people, our friends, on Christmas Day. Because they get more during that time than any gift could ever give them. So if you're depressed right now and if you think that you're worthless, I challenge you to go out and serve this week. Whatever your talents are. Maybe it's writing someone a letter. Maybe it's baking someone cookies. Maybe it's volunteering at a homeless shelter. Maybe it's collecting clothes and donating something. Whatever your talents are, church, serve so that you can bring joy to those around you. But serve so that God can bring joy to you as well. Like I said, it is very hard to be depressed when you're serving. And I promise you, that Sunday when I was feeding the homeless, I was trying to be depressed. I didn't want to be happy. I didn't want to be thankful. I wanted nothing to do with joy. But I tell you, we walked out of that place much different than we walked in that place that day. Jason, guys, if you want to come on up here. Now remember last week, we talked about the book of Psalms, and I called it kind of the book of depression, because so many of the chapters written in the book of Psalms were written by David when he was, in, was, in, when he was depressed. But that's really not what people call it. See, I call it the book of depression, but what a lot of people call it is actually the book of worship. Because inside of the book of Psalms are more verses of praise and worship than any other book in the Bible. And perhaps no book in the Bible exemplifies the spirit of praise and worship more than the book of Psalms. 
David wrote, David wrote in Psalm 107, verse 13, Then he cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of gladness and of the shadow of death, and broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars, bars of iron in two. David wrote in Psalm 89, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound of worship. Because when we're worshiping God, it is very hard to be depressed when you're worshiping. It is very hard to be depressed when you're worshiping. Well, what is worship? Worship is what we do here in church, where we sing out to the Lord, where we raise our hands, where we close our eyes. But worship is everything we do every day to honor and draw closer to God. See, worship just isn't something we do here. Worship is something we should be doing in our cars. Worship is something that we should be doing in our houses. Worship is something that we should be doing at work. Church, we should always be worshiping the Lord in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. And when we start to worship the Lord, we're going to find that there is joy in worship. David wrote in Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy. I bet it's safe to say that when we're worshiping God and when we're really feeling the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a joy and a peace that overcomes you that you probably don't experience any other time in your day. It's that joy and that peace of the Lord that we begin to experience and we begin to feel and we begin to let into our hearts. And so we must worship because what we sing is true, church. Yes, He is faithful. Yes, He is loving. Yes, He is powerful. Yes, He is kind. But as we worship and we feel that joy, an amazing thing happens, church. Not only do we draw closer to Him, but He will draw closer to us. And He will begin to minister and meet our needs exactly when and where and how we need them. As we sing and worship to Him, He will begin to touch those parts of our hearts that need to be touched. As we worship Him, we will feel the tears of joy running down our face. Yeah, there's one other thing that happens when we worship. When we worship the Lord, the Bible says that His enemies flee. Second Chronicles 20, 22 says, Now when they had begun to sing and to praise, the Lord sent out ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. So church, when we worship, our depression flees. Because it's very hard to be depressed when we are worshiping the Lord. When we worship the Lord, we expect Him to come. We expect Him to heal. We expect Him to answer our prayers. Remember the story in Acts. Paul and Silas are sitting in prison and they're worshiping. They're singing out, crying to the Lord. What happens? kind of fall down, don't they? When we worship the Lord, powerful and mighty things can and will happen to us. So church, if you feel depressed, the best thing that you can do, whether you're in your car or you're at home, is get worship music and put it on. If you have a CD, put it in. If you have satellite radio, turn it on. You see, when the enemy hears, when depression hears worship, it flees because it doesn't want to be in the presence of the Lord. So we must worship the Lord at all times, at all places, and in all things. And that's why I changed the worship a little bit today, church. We're going to spend the next few minutes worshiping. We're going to sing three songs now, and I want you to begin feeling the presence of the Lord. You know, if you're depressed, I want you to cry out to the Lord now. I want you to raise your hands. I want you to close your eyes. Let Him draw near to you. Let Him begin to heal you and touch you like only He can. Remember last week, the title of the sermon and the title today is Where is your hope? But remember, the hope is the Lord. So if you're asking, where is 
my hope. Church, I'm here to tell you your hope is everywhere around you. So we're going to spend some time in worship here. Close your eyes. I asked for the pick songs that we would know. I want you to close your eyes. Raise your hand. 